Greetings, my name is Vincent. In this episode, we're going to be doing a nostalgic homage to the latest Warhammer 40k box set, Leviathan, here at Bunker 6. As with any model, you're probably going to want to do some priming first, so we're just getting that first stage done here. I'm just using black because most of the colours that we're going to be using are going to start off quite dark with blues and purples. Now we're going to do the base coat here. Because this is Ultramarines, we're going to start off with Macrag Blue, as you can see here. Now you can use Drakenhof Nightshade at this point for the actual shading, which is a more modern technique, but I'm going to stick to Nuln Oil because I want a more extreme contrast due to the scale. As you can see, very punchy. Once the wash is dried, we're going to go back in with the base coat and just clean up some of the areas where we don't want that Nuln Oil to be sitting. Wherever you think natural light would be hitting the model is where you want to remove the wash. This base coat of black is actually used to create outlines for areas of importance such as around the gun barrels and around the thumb because those areas from the pictures that I've seen have a little black outline, so I'm putting that in first rather than doing it later. We're going to be using Avalan Sunset as our mid-tone for the yellow power fists, and we'll obviously be adding some shades and some highlights later. I'm not covering the power fist in wash, I'm just making sure that it's sitting under that particular crease so it creates some level of depth to the power fist. Now I'm moving on to any part of the model that requires white paint. As you can see here, in order to create a fake outline, I'm actually just painting around certain areas and leaving some parts exposed, which looks like an artificial outline, as you can see here. Now to make these Terminators feel super nostalgic, we're going to give them bright red bolt guns. It did take a couple of coats, but that's no problem at all. You just have to take your time and be patient. As you can see here, using a very fine detail brush, you'll be able to get splendid results. Now to give this red that sort of British post box look, I'm going to be using a transparent red from Vallejo model color, which does a great job of making the red even more vibrant before we move on to the highlights. I then decided to make the center Terminator have the rank of veteran sergeant, but it wouldn't be right just to give a veteran sergeant the rank without also giving them the helmet color too. So the red and white helmet it is. And already with just a few steps, these Terminators are coming along nicely. To keep things very nostalgic, I'm actually going to be adding some of the hazard stripes onto the power fists. And as you can see, it does require quite a fine brush, but if you make a mistake, you can always fix it. Just paint over it and do it again. And just make sure that you use the finest brush in your collection to do something like this. The good thing about a model at this scale is there really isn't too much to paint. So when it comes to doing things like highlights, of course, which are generally smaller areas of paint compared to, say, mid-tones or base coats, there's very little to do. The little bit that you do have to do, though, has to be placed in the appropriate places. So what I'm doing is I'm focusing on areas that I think would catch the most light. So the highest areas and the harshest edges. And that's about it. As you can see, I'm just focusing my attention on the very top of the power fist and the bottom edge of the thumb area. Literally a dot of paint and you're done. Once the yellow highlight was finished, I then moved on to the blue highlights. Now I'm actually starting with a quite dark blue here because we've got a few stages to get up to our brightest points. Right now, I'm just making sure that this particular blue is being placed on raised areas and being pulled towards the harshest edges once again and down to the leg areas where I think that the light would hit. Obviously, there's not too much to paint here, but it can make a big difference if you're placing highlights in areas that the brain isn't expecting them to be, and kind of throw the viewer off. Once the Calderon sky layer was finished, I then moved on to Fenrisian Grey, which is a bluey grey that is quite bright, and I was saving this for some of the harshest areas, the most acute corners that I wanted to highlight. As you can see, I'm making sure that I'm pulling that Fenrisian Grey to a center point when it comes to the chest pieces, 
and I'm pulling it to the corners of the shoulder pads and acute corners and very sharp edges as you can see. Because contrast is so important at this six millimeter scale, it's really good if you can make sure that your darkest and your lightest points have their own areas to breathe. It doesn't really matter if it's a blue or if it's a red, as long as your viewer can definitely see a dark red and a bright red that are naturally blending into each other, you're going to have a very strong result. The very brightest highlight is the Fire Dragon Bright, and it is basically an orange, but it works very nicely as just a tiny, tiny flash in all the harshest corners for the red sections. After the red was finished, I decided to move on to the metallics. In this particular instance, there is only one metallic to paint, and that is the silver. I'm just focusing on some very specific areas from the magazines of the guns, the barrels of the guns, the thumb of the power fist, and the sort of piping in the back, and that's it. One of my favorite things when it comes to the Epic 40K 3rd edition paint schemes was actually the bases. They had these very nice sandy bases. There was no instructions on to how to do them, but I tried my best to emulate what I saw in this particular picture. If you have an Epic 40K Battles book, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's kind of got this nice sandy finish, and so that's what I'm trying to recreate here as best as I can. And for me, I just think it's a delight to see this sort of sandy golden tone contrast with this rich blue. I think they work perfectly together. When it comes to basing, obviously I recommend not using your nice brushes. So every brush that I'm using here is either an old brush or a very, very cheap brush. I like using these flat head brushes just to do some of the highlighting. They're not as stiff as proper dry brushes, but if you're delicate and concentrate, you can still get the same result if you just delicately drag the paint across the top part of the things like the sandy texture, and you'll still get great results. In my haste to recreate nostalgic 1997 bases, I completely forgot that I had to do the chapter markings on the shoulder pads, so I had to do that next. Now, as you can see, I'm not using any transfers or anything like that, this is all freehand, but if you're worried about doing something like this at this scale, don't panic because you can always go in and fix things afterwards. Get the general shape that you're looking for, and then just look at the gradient of paint that you have, so starting from the dark blue all the way up to the light blue, and make sure that wherever you're trying to fix mistakes, you're using the correct color blue for where you're trying to make the repair. So in dark area, you're gonna obviously use one of your base colors, and if you're trying to repair something that's in the brighter section, then you can mix up some blues for that brighter section. But obviously don't use the wrong colored tone blue, because obviously then you're going to see the repair. And after about half an hour, the shoulder pads are as good as I care for them to be. Those were the adorable little Terminators. Now let's move on to the scary Tyranid Lictor. Due to the age of these models, many of them are secondhand. So this particular Lictor came to me shipped like this, already primed in white and on a square base. Now the 1997 Lictors are actually on a modified rectangular base, but I quite like the square base for this particular instance. I'm not normally a fan of the square bases because I grew up liking the rectangular ones, but I think for this particular style of model, the square base works quite well. I'm not sure how that's going to affect the rules of the Lictor, but we're not really here for that. We're just here to paint a good looking model. The model was primed off camera, but you can basically get the idea that I've primed it, but I've also primed the stones as well, just so they're all a regular black, and so paint can bond to them a little bit better than if we just left the rocks and sand raw. You'll also see that I've sanded the edges of the base because I didn't like how thick and chunky some of those layers of white paint were as the model came to me. So I sanded them down and I'll smooth them off even more later. All that's happening right now is I'm doing all the base colors that are required for the Lictor. This has basically got a sort of semi gene stealer theme to it with the purples and the blues, but I'm also basically copying the artwork from within the Battles Book too. I'm starting off with a Rhinox hide here because I think a brown to a red transition works quite nicely, more so than a black to red transition. 
This brown looks really nice and I think once I start doing some of the glazing into the red, it'll look quite natural. But for now I'm just cleaning up the talons and the claws or whatever you call these things sticking out the lictor and making sure they've got a nice black foundation before I start moving on to highlighting them later in the video. I believe that even if these models are 6mm or even 2mm, you can tell when someone cares about what they've been working on, whether it's a cupcake or a vehicle restoration or a little model like this. If you're proud of your work, you're going to be much more passionate about looking after it and sharing that experience with other people. I'm not saying you have to paint to Golden Demon standards, I'm saying you have to care yourself if you even dream of wanting other people to care about the work that you create. And I'm not trying to put unnecessary pressure on people, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm just saying that I know it feels better when I gave everything I could to a model. And look, even if I know I could do better, I can always do better on the next model. Perfection paralysis is a real thing. The amount of people I know who would just not finish something because it needs to be perfect, instead of just trying to make the next project better than the last one, has stifled so many things from being finished that the world doesn't get to see. Life is very short and you want to make the most of it, so get cracking through those projects, and if you can't do it as best as you can that time, make sure that the next time is an improvement on the last. Now the only tricky part of this entire video is actually the red part of the Elector Claws, because I need to do some glazing here. Now I'm not a big fan of glazing, I'm not very good at it, and especially with these thick base paints. You want to dilute them down, but then of course when you start diluting paints down, then you end up with potentially watermarks and things like that. You have to just take your time and really know how much of the paint and water you need to dab off the brush before you start putting it onto the model and starting the glazing process. If you're ever feeling too stressed about a particular section, you can always move on to a different section like I'm doing here. I kind of gave up on the glazing for a minute. I'm like, I'll come back to this with some fresh eyes in half an hour or so, but I'll work on a different part of the model like I'm doing here, just doing some of the shading over the carapace of the lictor. Once the shading on that section was finished, I then moved on to the shading of the skin. Very easy, just make sure that you're pulling that wash into all of the nooks and crevices where it's required. As you can see here, I'm pulling the shading down to that bone joint of the claw rather than just smothering the entire claw in this particular wash because then you're not going to get any type of contrast that you're looking for. Pulling the paint down to these sections where you want them to be the darkest, making sure the lightest parts have the least amount of paint on is the way to go. I then plucked up the courage to move back to the reds and as you can see here I'm doing my sort of post box technique again of creating that ultra bright red with the transparent red from Vallejo and now I'm just starting to skim my brush over those red areas just to create more of that glaze and because it is a transparent red it's actually quite forgiving when it's going over that Rhinox hide. Even though it's quite small I'm also having to use sort of a dragging glazing technique here for the tongue too. As I still want the top half of the tongue to be the darkest point, which is currently black. I don't want the entirety of the tongue being green, because then once again, I'm going to lose contrast. At least now it looks like it's going from a dark, dark green to a lighter green, even though that's not actually the case. And now I'm just highlighting the glazing work of the green that I've done. As you can see, just focusing right on the tip there, making sure the previous green layer is still seen. Tidy things up a little bit, and there we are. I'll say it again and again, the great thing about painting at this scale is you use barely any paint. And so as you can see, I'm using pinpricks of paint here on the claws and the tips of the knuckles, just with some Evil Suns Red. And then we'll go in with the Fire Dragon Bright to just do the very, very last pinpricks of flash highlighting at the very end. And then the reds will be finished. As you can see, I'm using the very back of my brush, and that's because I'm trying to pull the paint down very specifically towards the bottom. So I start painting from a part of the brush which doesn't have any paint on it, and then drag the brush towards the same point where I want the paint to start coming off the brush, if that makes sense. So here we are, the final highlight of the red going in some very specific places. The tippy tips of anything that already had the Evil Suns highlight is then getting this final flash of Fire Dragon Bright to really make those highlights nice and punchy. I decided to use my bluey black highlights rather than my grey black highlights for the claws as you can see here, just starting off with Dark Reaper making sure that I'm pulling that paint upwards towards the tip of the claws, making sure there's still some black left at the bottom to create that idea of contrast. 
To keep the bluey grey theme going, I've now bumped up to Thunderhawk Blue, making sure that I'm using less paint, and the paint that is being used is focusing on even less area as the Dark Reaper did. And as you can see, it's just being pulled up towards the tips and creating that extra colour without losing the layers beforehand. And just to emphasise how sharp these claws are, I'm just going in with a final layer of Fenrisian Grey, just making sure that it's an even smaller area that's being covered than the previous layer. And there we are, we've got the claws nice and shiny. At this scale, contrast is king, so even little areas like this brown section at the top of the claw, I'm even giving them highlights too, just so every single section feels like it has a dark mid-tone and bright spot to it, so that it really punches and sticks out on the tabletop. The same is also applied to the purple parts of the claw arms and the front of the face, making sure that I'm pulling all that lighter paint to the brightest areas of concern around the eyebrows, around the lips, any raised surfaces that you think the light would be catching are the kind of areas that you want to be focusing in on. The flash type of highlight that I'm going to be using for the skin section is Pallid Witch Flesh, which is a very, very light pale purple, as you can see, looks basically white because it's sitting on top of a purple. It has a sort of a natural progression from those dark purples. So just making sure that I'm creating these sort of artificial ridges in the bone section and just highlighting the face a little bit more to create that final sense of pop. Once I was satisfied with the highlighting on all the purple areas, I moved back to the carapace slash bone section. I'm just adding two highlights one thing I will say when it comes to doing any highlights, it's always kind of good to get up to a white if you can. The good thing about getting all the way up to a white color, or as close as you can possibly get to white is, that's the brightest color you can get. So if you can get natural transitions up to a white, you're going to be having a really great time when it comes to creating models with high, high contrast. As you can see here, I'm working my way up to an ivory, which is kind of an off-white, but it will give that sense of super crisp brightness when it comes to this particular model. Now obviously working up to a white is not always the easiest, but you can do it with basically any color in the color palette if you know the progress you need to take to get up to that. And then simplify it down to two or three steps to get to that white point that you're looking for. So for example, if it's red, you can go red to orange to yellow and then up to white. And if it's a purple, you can just keep on adding white to that purple mix the same can be said for blues too. And green, you're just gonna go from green to yellow to white. And as you can see here, I'm just working my way up slowly from the dark blue, all the way up to a lighter blue, and then finally to a flash of white on some of the areas that I want to make predominant in the body section. So whether it be the rib cage or the wrist or the top of the legs, you'll see that I start slowly contrasting my way up to a white point. And that's how you make a model really stand out, especially at this scale. And if you've gone through those steps and you're still finding white is looking a little bit artificial, you can always use an off-white like an ivory or something like that so it's not completely crisp white. And speaking of using an off-white, as you can see here, I'm just pulling out the sharpest points that I want to highlight with an ivory paint. You can use any kind of cream or anything like that. Preferably you want to use a type of white that's complementary to the color that you're painting onto. So if you're painting onto a blue, use a very, very, very pale blue. If it's bone, then obviously you can use something like a cream or an ivory, and so on and so forth. And with red though, it can be tricky, because of course, when you start mixing white into red, you just get pink. So just be very careful and make sure that you plan things before you start painting them, just to save yourself time on fixing errors. Now the model is finished, I'm going to be moving on to the basing of the lictor. Now, as you can see, I decided to base this model in a much more complex way than the sandy finish of the ultramarine stand, and that's for a reason. I just wanted to show you a different way of basing this particular model, so there was more for you to see in the video. And what I used is mixed sand, so you're going to have some small rocks or some sandy pieces and mixtures of all different types in between. What I generally like to do is pick out bits that I think suit the model rather than just dunk it in one go, especially when the model's already been fully painted like this. 
you don't want to cover it in dust or anything like that. So if you can get into that box of mixed sand and look through it for specific pieces that will work well, drop it onto the glue, then that's a much better way to go, I think. The next step was to add some grass or flock. Now I'm going to be using a tweezer and applying the grass just by shoving it on top, as you can see here. It's not going to go on as neatly as, say, static grass will, but it doesn't really matter at this scale. Having it like this is going to be completely fine. As long as it still kind of sells the idea of what you're trying to do with it, that's all that matters. I do once again recommend that you use a tweezer or something like this to apply the grass rather than dunking the model into a big pot of flock or grass. I've just picked out a few areas where I wanted that flock to sit. Make the sizes as random, as ununiform as possible to make it seem even more natural. Now I'm using some grassy foam material to give the idea of there being some moss growing out of some of these rocks. I wanted to just feel like quite aggressive alien landscape, but I didn't want it to be completely barren. A lot of these alien landscapes generally are sort of some theme of a desert, but we already have that with the Terminators. So in this instance, I wanted things to feel like they had a little bit of life going on in them. And last but not least, we're just going to be painting the rim of the model just to get everything nice and tidy. And the nostalgic Leviathan box set homage is complete. we are, the Terminator Squad versus the Lictor. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did in painting the little miniatures in the 1997 third edition Epic 40k style. As always, I'm Vincent, and until next time, I'm signing off from here at Bunker 6. Yeah.